everybody. How's it going? I hope you're having a lovely Friday morning. Today what I'd like to do is I'd like to go over what it's like to have a framework laptop two years into having a framework laptop. I've had this device for about two years and I've really put it through the ringer. You probably can't tell because of the lighting in the room, but there's a, there's a dent around somewhere around over here and there's a bunch of scratches on it. I've dropped this thing many, many times and it has survived the test of time. So I thought I would tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly of owning a framework laptop. The TLDR is that I am currently happy with this laptop, even though there are some things that could be better on it. I used to use a ThinkPad P50 as my daily driver, which is a considerably different machine. The P50 is designed to be a heavy workstation. This is more designed kind of like an, an ultra bookish machine. This is the first generation framework. This has an 11th gen Intel processor. So let's get into it. The first thing that I like about it, obviously, is its durability. I am a klutz and I take this on planes all the time. And it, admittedly also, again, I am a klutz and I also have a cat that likes to knock my computer off of tables anytime that the cat wants attention. And sometimes it'll knock it off of even high places. Let's say I have it on a dining room bar counter that I have. He'll knock it over from something that's six feet up, which is, again, a fairly difficult drop for a laptop to take. And this laptop has taken it all in stride. I've never had to tighten the hinges and I've never broken them. One of the annoying things about a lot of cheap PC laptops is you get stuff like this. Thank you to Recover Tech on YouTube for the picture. You can see over here where the hinge itself is not broken, the grommets that it attaches to are broken. Or again, over here, thank you to Computer Warehouse for the image. This is a circle over here of a hinge that has broken off of the base. So the hinge is still good, but the base that it screws into has broken off because it's some cheap shit plastic. And that is not the case with this laptop. Again, if that were the case with it, this would have been broken two years ago. So the durability of this is shockingly great for its size and, again, it being a first-generation product from a new company. That's something that I really appreciate. Let's get into the other part of using it with a comparison with a ThinkPad, uh, the keyboard and the trackpad. Unfortunately, this is an area where I'm just never going to get used to a normal laptop keyboard. One of the reasons that I used ThinkPads as long as I did is the keyboard layout they had just made sense to me. When I would switch to using a ThinkPad versus using a desktop keyboard, I never felt like I had to get used to a different layout. It just felt natural to me. And when I use any other laptop, not just framework, virtually any other laptop, the keyboard seems foreign to me. Even though I'm two years into having this device, just the fact that, like, again, there's no home button up here, I have to hit function and left for home and stuff like that, I just, I cannot, I just, I can't wrap my head around it and get used to it. My ThinkPad P50 has been demoted to being a server in my closet that I use to store and record koi fish videos from my koi fish pond in my backyard. And when I took that thing out of the closet after not using it for two years and I started typing on it, I immediately felt at home with it, even though I had been typing on the framework for two years and had not typed on the ThinkPad for two years. The ThinkPad keyboard just feels natural in a way that no other laptop keyboard has ever felt to me. And that's why I was so loyal to them over time. And the next thing over here is this little track point. So ThinkPads come with something called the track point in the middle over here. This is what you can use to move the mouse instead of using the trackpad. Now, if you're using Windows, you'll probably have a decent trackpad experience with this laptop the way I did. If you're using Linux, <laughs> palm rejection. What's well, palm rejection? You, you're going to have to do that thing if you're using XFCE where you set up the trackpad to not work for a certain number of milliseconds after you've typed a key on the keyboard because if you do, you're going to wind up, especially if you have tap to click enabled and you don't set that up, oh my God, you are going to be in a world of pain where you're like every time you you you, you tap, it, there's no, it's just going to be a nightmare. Now, it, admittedly, again, this is not a framework only thing. Tr again, palm rejection is a meme on Linux with virtually every trackpad from every laptop I've ever used. However, what I like about the ThinkPad is that I have the option in the BIOS to turn this piece of junk off and only use the track point over here. There's two things I like about the track point. The first thing I like about the track point is I don't have to move my hand in order to use it. So if you are using a modern laptop, you kind of, again, if I'm typing and then I want to use the trackpad, I have to move my hand. I have to, it's, it's kind of, this is movement that I have to do to get over here. Whereas if I'm using a track, track point, I can type and then my finger that I'm typing with can immediately go over to the track point and I can use that to move the mouse. Uh, so I don't have to make as many hand movements, it's more efficient. But more importantly, what I like about track points is I don't have to worry about palm rejection because track pants don't have 
palms. This, this isn't, your palm is never going to be near that, so there's no need for palm rejection, which gets around the Linux meme of not having palm rejection on trackpads. I can turn off the trackpad in the BIOS and still use the mouse, which makes it a little bit easier for me to use a ThinkPad in Linux than it does to use a framework in Linux. The next thing that I really took some getting used to is sleep state. So there are a lot of people on Frameworks Forum that are reporting that they are having issues with sleep in Linux, where they put the device in suspend mode, and it still winds up using 20 or 30% battery when they go to sleep at night. So if you put it on suspend, you go to sleep, you wake up eight hours later, and your battery that was at 70% is now at 55 or 40%. This is a meme, and it actually happened to me as well. My battery right now, I just took the thing out of my bag after putting it in suspend yesterday, and my battery is at 10% because I put it in suspend. I have done the thing where I do cat, sys, power, mem, uh, underscore sleep to make sure that I am in deep sleep mode, not the other sleep mode. And it is S2 idle deep, but even in S2 idle deep in Linux, you're going to take the laptop out of your bag. It's going to be mildly warm and it's and it will have eaten up about 20 or 30 percent battery, which is incredibly, incredibly annoying. This is something that people have solved by using Hibernate instead of sleep. But using Hibernate can be a little bit tricky, especially if you are using CryptFS and you have an incredible encrypted drive. I have an encrypted drive. And further, I don't even have a swap partition because I have so much RAM. I thought to myself, I have 32 gigs of RAM in this. I'm not going to install this with a swap partition. So I would have to resize my main partition, install a swap partition, figure out how to set up encrypted swap with Hibernate. I have two companies, two nonprofits, and a full-time job. So I'm, 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 just, I'm just being real here. I'm never going to make the time to do that. And I have not made the time to do that. I have just put the thing in suspend and cursed when I take it out of my bag, and there's not as much battery. Some people had this issue with Windows versus the whole modern standby versus normal thing. And the way that they were able to solve it on the forum appears to be they had there were some issues with audio drivers. There was an audio driver that was keeping the machine from going in a full standby. But they were able to fix that with Windows. With Linux, it again, unfortunately, on this laptop, suspend on Linux is kind of a meme. And uh, if there is a way to fix that, I'm all ears, but it's, um, it's if you think that you're going to install Ubuntu on this and then just close the lid and put it in your bag and have a normal suspend, no. You're, you're going to be searching forums and searching IRC chats and reading manuals for hours upon hours to try and get functional suspend and or hibernate. And if, if you do, um, you know. You're smarter than I am. Next up are ports. The modular ports in here are, again, I think 50 good, 50 bad. So the 50% good in the modular ports is that they make the laptop very durable. So I have actually broken several of these. You can even see that there's a little chip in this one already because I've dropped this thing so many times. I have broken this thing many, many times. What I like is that if you are going to break something, all the pressure goes on this rather than on the motherboard itself. So having modular ports means when you get, when you're tugging on it or when you do something wrong, you're breaking the casing and you're breaking this little cheap piece rather than actually breaking the motherboard. Because a lot of people are using laptops where the ports are directly soldered onto the motherboard and you're plugging directly into that port that's soldered onto the motherboard. So if you pull it or you yank it or you put pressure on it, you're directly damaging your motherboard, not some cheap thing that you can replace for 10 or 20 bucks. So these ports, these modular modular ports that they have make the device a lot more durable. In terms of making the device more useful or flexible, I mean, that that's really a question there. If you take a look at, let's say, a ThinkPad, you get an SD card reader, a USB port, an HDMI port, more USB ports, RJ45, two more Thunderbolt ports, another USB-C port. Even on the uh, smaller ThinkPads, you get a fuller range of ports, and you typically get more ports on these than you do on here. So rather than having modular ports, I'd rather have more ports. So having a charge port, two USB-C ports, two USB ports, an SD card reader, and an HDMI port means a lot more to me than having four modular ports. I'd rather have more ports. But what I do like about this, again, is that these are not soldered onto the motherboard, which means when I break them, and I do, this one is literally almost about to f finish falling apart, I can simply purchase a new one and slide it in rather than having to take this to a repair shop to fix a port that I broke off the device on my motherboard. It's a thoughtful design when you think about durability, even if I don't have as many ports as I would like. I would much prefer to have more ports and have them be modular. But again, that's that's me wanting everything. That's me wanting my have, have my cake and eat it too. Let's talk about the way that framework handles design flaws, because I think this is actually considerably better than certain trillion dollar companies that will give you the middle finger anytime you have a problem. One of the things I've talked about on this channel when it comes to Apple is they will often have these random design flaws and glitches that they do not cover unless you have 
sued them. And once they get sued, if they hit with a class action lawsuit, they will eventually cover it with a half-assed extended warranty program that most people didn't use because they threw out the computer after it didn't work for three to four years. Anyway, Framework has a very nice way of dealing with this. So there is a design flaw in this product. It, this is a first-gen product that is to be expected, new company, first-generation product. There is a design flaw with it, and that has to do with the RTC battery. The design flaw is as follows. If you have the device and you turn it off at 80% battery, and you stow it away for a couple of weeks or a couple of months and you don't use it, and then you decide to take it out again when you decide to travel and you take it on an airplane, it won't work. Even though the battery is at 80%, the RTC battery on the motherboard is drained, and it doesn't charge itself from the primary battery. So what winds up happening here is you need to plug it in in order for it to work. The RTC battery in this motherboard is not charging itself off of the laptop battery, it's charging itself off of the charger. So what happens is if you don't plug it in for a while, even if the laptop battery itself is charged, the RTC battery is not charged and it won't turn on. They originally came up with a solution which was a motherboard modification. They were not performing it. They put instructions on their side on how to perform it. This is the kind of thing that's probably gonna take a technician like Chris at my store a half hour to do, which means that it's not gonna be something that is economically viable for me to provide to you uh, for a several year old computer that in my opinion should have a fixed release that's better than that. And I talked about that in this video. Let's talk about the framework situation and what should have been done. And they actually replied in a really great way. They came up with an RTC battery solution which is much easier where you are replacing this, R again, instead of having to scrape stuff on the motherboard and run all these tiny jumper wires, you're only soldering one wire onto the computer and you're replacing an RTC battery. So it does require soldering but this is a 10 way, 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 way easier job to do. This is much easier to do, which means you're going to be paying a lot less in labor cost if you take it to a repair shop than the clue solution they had before, and they're going to provide you the battery for free. Is this a perfect solution? No, but it's probably the best thing that they could have done given the circumstances, which I'm really happy with. Again, what would have happened with Apple, in my opinion, if something like this happened, they would have said, what do you mean? Uh, what are you talking about? We've never heard of an iPhone 6 Plus that has a touch problem. Oh, your iPhone 7 has no audio or no service sometimes? You must be the only one that happens to. Would you like to get a new phone for 350 That must be user error. Whereas they're saying, yeah, there's a problem. Here's the fix for it. We're going to give you the part for free. That's really cool. That's honorable. And that makes me respect the company a lot more than other companies that would refuse to acknowledge design flaws. Especially when acknowledging a design flaw on your first generation product. Again, this is the kind of thing that can kind of sink a company financially if they are going to take on liability for actually replacing all these boards or people. And they were open to say, yeah, there's a problem. Here's how you fix it. And contact us and we'll send you the part for free. That's cool. That is really, really cool. I installed this in my device, and because I'm a moron that decided I'm not going to follow the instructions, screw that, it's my computer, I can break it. I actually wound up breaking the mounting tab on the board, but I soldered the battery in to make this into a MacBook. I had mentioned in this video many years back that when I had went to lobby in Albany in 2015, that there was a lobbyist who told a politician that when I am fixing MacBooks, I am turning them into PCs and misrepresenting them as if they are still MacBooks to my customers, which is wrong. And today, I did the exact opposite of that. I took a device that had a removable battery and I soldered it in. So I actually converted this into an Apple product. In all seriousness, uh, I like the fact that there was a problem with the product and they just admitted it. Again, was it perfect the way they admitted it? No, but they did the right thing in the end and that's what matters to me. Uh, at the end of the day, I think this is a fine device and I am happy to use it just to get across to people that I, I, I'm willing to deal with the issues with suspend and I'm willing to deal with the funky keyboard layout to signal to people that I value a laptop that makes schematics available. The last thing is the whole schematics or die thing. Again, the schematics thing, is it handled perfectly? No, you need to sign an NDA in order to get access to a schematic but they do give you access to a schematic, which is more than every other laptop manufacturer is going to do. That's cool. That really is. So I am willing to use this warts and all because I want to get across to people that I value the approach that they're taking. I value the fact that when there's a problem, they are willing to admit it to their customers. And above all, I value the schematics or die ethos of it, as well as just how easy it is to open and get into. I want to use this laptop because I want to support a company and I want people to see me using a laptop that supports a company that actually cares about these things. Making schematics available, being honest when there's a design flaw, making something that's easy to open and repair. It, to me, that's worth all the warts. Like yeah, sometimes I use by that old ThinkPad and the keyboard is easy and I have a track point, but is Lenovo going to give me a schematic? 
Probably not. That's what I think about this device. I think it's a fine little device. If you're buying this expecting that you're going to get the same price to performance ratio that you get when you buy an M1 MacBook, you're not going to get that. And again, like, you know, like I open too many browser tabs in Firefox and I hear the fan spin. There are some luxuries that you get with other brands that you're just not going to get with a framework. I'm not going to bullshit you and tell you that you're going to have that level of experience with this. When I'm using an M1 MacBook and I'm encoding a video and I literally can't hear anything coming out of it, and then I use the framework and I open a few tabs in Firefox and I hear the fan spinning, I understand that I'm giving something up in order to use a product from a company that values repairability, that values taking account Accountability and responsibility when they do something wrong, and that values make schematics available. There is a trade off there. There is an honest trade off, but there's a trade off that I am happy to make in order to portray to all of you that I value this company for going above and beyond to make a product that they want to stand behind being repairable. Do I miss the ThinkPad keyboard? Yes, I do. I miss that thing a lot. Every single day, I think about going into that closet and pulling out that P50. But I don't. I like my framework. It's a good little device. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Did this help you with uh, your decision on whether or not to get a framework for the future, or did it not? Do you think I'm too picky when it comes to the ThinkPad laptop keyboard, or are you one of those people that uses a ThinkPad laptop keyboard and thinks to yourself, I can't use anything else after this? It's just no. Because like, that, that's just been my experience. Like, I have a desk, I have a Microsoft Wired 600 desktop keyboard that I like, and I'm used to using it. And when I use anything other than a ThinkPad, I just feel like I'm on another planet. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments down below. I think this is a fine little device. And uh, out, yeah, again, the, the warts with it are the whole, uh, the, the suspend issue, the, uh, the no palm rejection and Linux issue, which again is going to be with virtually every laptop, and the funky-ish keyboard layout that they have. Other than that, this is a fine little device, and I am happy to own it and use it when I travel. That's it for today, and as always, I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, please do leave them in the comments, and I will do my best to answer them. I'll see you in the next one. Bye now.